You've heard us talk a lot about the history of the game ball itself in the game of the gridiron. And Timothy B. Brown, our guest today, has talked quite a bit with us and shared quite a bit. And now he's wrote a book, The History of Football. And he's going to talk about that book tonight in our episode where we get to talk, interview him about this amazing story and the game ball itself. Tim's up in just a moment to tell us all about it. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the pig pen, your portal of a positive football history. And welcome to another exciting Tuesday as we get to talk to Timothy P. Brown of footballarchaeology.com about another great aspect of football and its legendary growth in, in history. Tim, welcome back to the pig pen. Thank you, sir. Yeah, looking forward to chatting yeah. a bit about uh, all things football. Yeah, definitely. And this is a, a special edition here, folks, because we're going to you know, go deep into the mind of the author uh, of a new book that Tim has coming out. Uh, Tim, why don't you give us the, the title uh, of your new book that's out? So it's called A History of the Football. Um, it's actually, uh, Microsoft Word does not like that title because it always thinks it should say History of Football. But this book is about the history of the football. So it's really the story of how the how the football came about, how it originated, how it developed over time, changed shape, changed size, changed colors, changed compression or inflation. Um, so it's kind of just that that whole the whole story of the history of the ball. Yeah, what what a great topic. Uh, when we're talking about the object that the game that we love is named after, uh, you know, you, it's you know, going right to the the roots of, of the game yeah. and uh, you know, talking about the object that we you know, probably most associate with the game of football. If somebody is going to put a an icon or an emoji up there for the game, it's it's going to be that, you know, the ball itself. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That's one behind you. That's great. Uh, so, Tim, what was sort of your inspiration uh, for writing this book? Yeah, so I, I mentioned this in a, I think in a, you know, maybe one of our the podcasts a couple of weeks ago, but, um, you know, my site now has like a thousand articles, and then I've written you know three books before now the fourth one, and what I was just finding was, um, it's, you know, kind of the information on any given topic was spread across. 20, 30 different articles, you know, so I've written a bunch of different things about helmets or knee pads or, you know, uh, you know, how the first down measurement process changed over time, you know, so there's all these kind of isolated articles. And then obviously, you know, as I'm doing research each time, I'm learning new stuff. So some of the things that I wrote about, say, in this book, or that I hope to be writing in, you know, future uh, books in the series will contradict what I wrote you know, three, four years ago, because I came across new information, you know, and, and, and I just, you know, thinking about things differently, you know, you just find new stuff. So, um, so, you know, it's one of those things where it was, it was just an attempt to, to put out, you know, books that are maybe a little bit more consumable from a size standpoint. So it's just like, this book is 134 pages, I think is the exact count. Um, you know, some of my earlier books were like three, 250, 350, you know, pages. So, um, you know, there's certain people who just won't pick up a book <laughs> of that size. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so this is just a little bit more of a quick read, you know, really a couple hours if you're a fast reader and you're, you know, you're done. Um, so that was kind of, you know, it was just the, the desire to document specific, you know, specific topics um, in more depth than, than I've ever done you know, or then that then I could do, for instance, in a more of a survey book. The other thing, though, and this is, you know, what I what I find every time I approach a new topic, um, you know, in, in this case, like I had covered a lot of topics about the the history of the football in individual uh, tidbits, and yet when I approached the story. 
from you know, like focusing on that story, I just ended up, you know, I put different search terms into the, you know, when I'm searching the newspaper archives, I'm searching new things or I come across some little story. And it's like, oh, geez, I got to look into this. So then you dive into that story. Um, so what ends up happening is, you know, if you, you, by focusing on one part of football, more specifically, you just, do, you know, you analyze things from a different angle, you come across new stories. And so while, you know, I would guess, I don't know, something like, you know, 80% of the stories, the general stories I talk about in the book, um, are things that I'd covered in some time in the past. I mean, almost everything I found, you know, there were new information uncovered, just new, new ways to look at the, at the, the information. Um, and really just kind of, you know, it's not revisionist history. It's, but it's just, you know, I learned new things. And so I revised what I believe about the story, you know, and I, I even, I ended the book by saying, that's what I know about the football as of, july of 2024 because that's what i knew at that point so and i've actually learned a couple of things since then that i would have changed <laughs> yeah yeah but that, definitely. that's the way it is you know definitely Be before we get any more deeper into the book some, some something that sort of catches uh, my eye when i when i got a copy of the book and i'm looking at the cover on the left hand side you know right by the binding you have a green strip of the book is mostly gold we're showing a picture of it right now so folks can look at it um but you have on their football archaeology series. Yeah. So, so this is the first of, of many, I, I take it. Yeah. 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 So I, I've outlined, I don't know, maybe 10 different books that I could potentially do a story on. Um, and, you know, maybe there's more out there. But again, it's the idea of, um, you know, so I could do like, you know, among the things that I could write about, you know, just one book on football officiating. And so that would take in probably, you know, penalty calls, but also all the ge the gear, the clothing, the equipment that officials use, kind of their role in the game, who they were in the training process, you know, so, uh, so it can, it, it's just diving deeper into it than I have, you know, for anything else. Um, you know, same thing, you know, different types of equipment, um, coaching, you know, the, that how coaching has evolved in over the uh, history of the game. Um, but I, I am actively working on the second uh, book and that is, um, I'm not sure what I'm going to call it yet because <laughs> uh, I'm not positive exactly how far I'm going to go with it. But so it's basically the history of the early forward pass um, is what it's. So it's, you know, I'm looking at, you know, kind of what brought about the forward pass. And I think most people, you know, generally understand that story, but like, when did people first start talking about it? You know, why did it even, you know, I'll get into some of the rugby roots of why they didn't allow the forward pass. Um, but, you know, so then how did it change? And then a lot of it will be, you know, when it was first implemented, just the struggle that they, that they had and, um, in, in some ways, the rules were very restrictive. There were other things about the rules that were very liberal compared to today. But the struggle of trying to figure out how do you throw the ball, you know, those kinds of things. So anyways, that's I'm going too far into the, the next book, but it's just kind of looking at how the forward, how, how the forward pass developed. And what I don't know yet is when am I going to stop and what year do I stop telling the story? I think uh, I have an idea, but I'm not sure. I'm sure that'll become enlightened uh, as you do your research on it. It's yeah. usually how that works anyway. Oh, and the okay. title will come to you and it'll all make sense at the end. So, so, okay, let's, let's go back into the history of the football book. This first of the series that uh, is out right now. So, uh, you know, you said 80% of it's uh, based on some tidbits. Uh, and I guess from a personal standpoint, uh, folks like myself that sort of got involved with your work through uh, your, your early books, you know, uh, how football became football. Uh, you had some rudimentary things, I believe, in that book uh, of, on on the football. Gave us some some basics on it. The tidbits sort of peeled that onion back a little bit more in pieces over time. And this goes into much more detail, like you said. So, like you said, described earlier, eighty percent of it is sort of old stuff that you've 
re reformed into this topic on you know specifically the football collected it all together and 20 percent is new what was maybe one of the most surprising elements that you found during your research in writing the book yeah so i just want i want to change one thing about what you said um and so just to clarify for my purposes i think 80 percent of what i covered topically was stuff that i had covered before okay that doesn't mean that it's the same information on those topics right so by digging further into those topics you know so like i don't remember ever covering how balls are manufactured and you know the leather and all those i don't remember I, maybe i did but uh but there's just lots of things where it's just like i reshaped or rethought or just Expo was exposed to a lot more information about those topics. So anyways. Okay. So, you know, I think um, one of the things that I really, if there was, for me, the most surprising thing that I learned was probably the, um, you know, like anybody else, I'm reading certain things. And so I, somebody a story gets repeated often enough that I assume that it's true. Right. So one of the stories was that, you know, in 1912, that was the first year where the rule book specified the size of the ball. You know, it says exactly, it's supposed to be this long and, you know, this wide and da, 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 da. So, you know, I think most people have assumed, and I mean, again, I've, read this a million times and I even said this and how football became football I had was saying okay well they adopted the forward pass in 1906 and then they decided hey we need a slimmer ball and so when they um when they put the new rules out for 1912 that's when the ball got slimmer well that's just wrong um or at least I'll put it this way I found no evidence that that is true <laughs> mm -hmm. what I did find is actually, you know, it's not discussed much at all. I've got some, you know, some comments made in like 1909 of the smaller ball that is the same size as what they did in 1912. So that tells me it was done before that, right? At, at 1909 at the latest. And and so this picture actually is, and it, you know, it shows the, the, the Wilson, uh, uh, J5 ball, or not Wilson, but Spalding J5 ball. Um, and, you know, it as best as I can tell, un until 19, through 1902, the Wilson, I'm sorry, the Spalding ball was, um, while they never said what size, you know, the rules didn't specify the size of the ball, it did say the official ball is the Spalding J5, right? And so whatever size Spalding made that ball to be, that was the size. And so then other manufacturers more or less made the same size ball, but even that's not 100% sure. But in 1903, they changed, Spalding changed the ball. They changed, you know, if you look at an older ball, it's got a different stitching pattern. The lacing's different. And then when you compare the two of them, just, you know, just images of the two, this ball is substantially slimmer than the previous ball, than the ball that they sold in 1902. Um, so, you know, based on the evidence I found, 1903 is when they changed the size of the ball, which, so it wasn't, it wasn't the forward pass that made him switch the ball. They switched it before the forward pass. And then it just so happened that that was beneficial, you know, in the, with the forward pass. So, and, you know, there's a lot of things like it in, uh, you know, rugby had slimmed down their ball in like 1892 and then in 1932. And, and it was because the ball, of, you know, the balls back in the day were 30 inches. You know, that was a standard rugby ball wow. when football began. And if, you know, if you look at the old, the real, the really old pictures, the ball is nearly round. You know, it's ovoid but it's nearly round. And just to, you know, if, if a 30 inch ball doesn't make that much sense to you, an NBA ball is 29 inches. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, 
the they were run you know lugging around a ball that was much more like carrying a basketball than carrying a football so and that's what they were kicking you know and so anyways you know it it, it was ovalish but um so anyways you know the ball got slimmed down over the course of time but you know the the whole story of the ball being slimmed down for the forward pass in 1912 I find no evidence of that. And um, now, then it did get slimmed down in 1929 and again in 34. And then, the, which I think is kind of interesting, the ball size, um, the NFL had always followed the college yearbook or rule book. So they used the, they used the, you know, whatever size ball the uh, NCAA used, that's what the NFL used. And then they did their own year, their own rule book in 32. So in 34, they still had the old rule, even though the colleges changed it. But they adopt then the NFL changed theirs in 35 to match the 34 ball that the NCAA had. That is still the same size ball that the that the NFL uses, unchanged. Oh. So the basic specifications, other than now it says like you know, has a urethane bladder instead of a rubber bladder it's the same ball you know in terms of basic specs the ncaa slim theirs down a little bit further in 82 but so it also just you know a thing that was maybe a little bit surprising was just that you know basically the nfl has had no influence on the size of the ball you know hmm. that's a purely college driven thing now, the NFL did have a big influence or has had a big influence working with Wilson on the quality of the ball and on the texture and grip of the ball, um, and you, the uniformity, you know, quality control processes. That's really where I think they, they've had the biggest impact. But the ball, unchanged since 1934. Yeah, I'm sending you, you made me uh, remember uh, when you're talking about the 1912 changes and I'm assuming the Pro Football Hall of Fame had this right. When I was there in 2021, we had a, a PFRA uh, meeting and they had some balls because we couldn't go there during COVID in 1920. It was 100th anniversary. They had some uh, re reproduction footballs of the same size that they would have used in 1920. So I'm assuming it, it's accurate. And it, of course, we could handle them and try to throw them around the Hall of Fame in their meeting room that we had. Uh that was not a pleasant thing to try to throw that football. I mean, it's yeah. quite a bit more girth than, than what we're used to. And yeah. uh, I, I can't imagine what it was back before 19, uh, whenever you said they changed when they were even bigger. So yeah, forward pass. Uh, I can see why it wasn't as successful and big spirals and everything like we see today. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things, you know, the discussions in 1906 and for the next, you know, 10, 15 years, um, very consistently coaches saying, well, you know, you need a guy who's got big hands. So if you don't have big hands, you're just not going to be able to throw the ball very well. Yeah, they so, still say that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, actually one of my brothers is quarterback and he like my thumb goes like this more mm -hmm. or less like an L his, he can get his to go you know, <laughs> like at a totally different angle than I can, I can, <laughs> but you know, he doesn't have big hands, but his thumb, yeah, he's like a monkey or something. His, you know, his hands go in a different, or his thumb goes in a different direction. So, so I mean, it, it wouldn't be just the size, but that's really pretty much the predominant issue. Now, is there a particular uh, ball uh, style or because uh, you you talk about a variety of different uh, football, not only the sizes but some of the decor and how they're made and everything. Is there one that maybe maybe not your favorite one that you'd want to see played today, but one that really you uh, were magnetized to and uh if you could tell us which one that would be and why yeah you know i don't know i i, I think um just be because i've i've never held one or owned one i you know i i love the old you know the white and yellow footballs with the black stripes you know i just <laughs> always find those images you know really intriguing um but you know the the story that i enjoyed chasing down most of all was trying to find documentation on the original balls that were used like back in 1876 right when when football really really got you know moving 
And the funny thing, so back then they, um, you know, so rugby balls, basketballs, and a couple other, you know, inflated balls, they were, if you look at the ads back then, they were, they were um, sold in different sizes. And it started like a 19 inch circumference. And then every three inches, it went up in circumference. And so the smallest one was a one, and then there was a two, and a three, and a four, and a five. And so the five was a 27 inch ball. Um, and so the J5, and now it still is the J5V. That's where the five comes from, back from the you know 1870s style of naming ball or of labeling balls. So, but nevertheless, they didn't, you know, in a lot of the early stuff, they didn't, they just said they used a rugby ball. Well, okay, well, what's a rugby ball? How big is a rugby ball? And so it it took a lot of detective work, but eventually I pretty much nailed it down through some kinds of documentation. But then I was able to, you know, I learned of of a football, you know, a rugby ball, but you know, I'm calling it a football that um, prints. You know, it's a long story, which I won't totally get into. But anyways, a ball from 1876 is sitting on in a trophy case at Yale University, and. It's, you know, it's got a silver plaque embedded on the thing that says this was used in these games and da da da. So I was able to get, you know, uh, a guy in the Yale Athletic Department to go, you know, get access to that trophy case and measure the thing, you know, to, to document the size of the ball. Because uh, I couldn't find it anyway, in any other way. So it, number one, it's just cool that here, here's a ball that was used in the first year of football. And it's still sitting there on a shelf. And, you know, he was able to confirm that it was a 30 inch ball, which is, you know, what I, exactly what I thought it was in the early, you know, the earliest days. So, and then, then football, you know, American football went to 27 inch ball and then, you know, successively slimmed it down from there. But a 30 inch ball, again, bigger than a basketball. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm sure you probably had a, a lot of, I know, researching books myself, you have uh, some really takes you on some different angles and some uh, some paths maybe you didn't think you were going to tread down when you first started writing it. What were maybe some of the more interesting and fun uh, research topics you had in the book? Well, you know, one of one of them that I really enjoyed, or t two that I really enjoyed is one is what were balls made out of? What's the, what type of leather? And then the other is... Um, you know, just kind of their appearance, the decorations. Um, so one of them is, you know, as I was looking at ads and newspaper articles from the 18th or from yeah, 19th century, one of the things that became very clear is that, you know, we have this perception that footballs are made of, you know, leather from cows. And actually it's steers, but, you know, at least the, the better quality ones are from steers and only parts of the the steer hide um but back in the day so, so not not a pig skin then like well not, oh okay okay <laughs> so again that's one of those things the story is they never used pig skin no one ever used pig skin so i mean there i found some ads and some articles indicating that they did have pig skin balls really oh huh. now it's i'm not absolutely a hundred percent sure that whether you know like somebody who is writing the ad may not have understood it because they you know the, the term pigskin was in use so they may have thought it was made of pigskin but one so i think they had balls made of pigskin uh in addition to the pig to the pig or sheep or whatever bladder that they inflated but 100 percent they had a lot of sheepskin balls back then. Those were just cheaper. Uh, you know, the sheepskin was cheaper than, um, than you know, the steer, steer hide. I don't know if that was because there were just more sheep skins available that they didn't have a better purpose for or what. But like, you know, a lot of times back then, if you bought a new, you know, if a mom or dad bought a suit for their boy, 
they could get a free sheepskin football, you know. So it was like the cheap way to get a ball. Yeah, you know, so it's kind of more of a kid's toy. Um, and then some of the early white leather balls weren't painted, but they were uh they used elk skin because it was a mm. lighter as they tanned it, it was a lighter leather. Um so you know that's yeah, so I just think that's kind of interesting. Again, it's uh, I've always been told, and every source I ever came across said no pig skin and balls have always been made of cow's leather. Well, no, that's not that's not true. And you know, there's just so much documentation on it that clearly there were sheepskin balls all over the place. Um, um I, I'm glad I'm glad you said that there was pig skin, so now I don't have to change the name of a website and a podcast and call it the steer skin uh dispatch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well yeah i mean it i mean it, the, the name you know the the traditional wisdom is the name comes from the pigskin bladder but you know i think back in the day it was like any bladder they could find they'd inflate it and kick it around so they used a lot of sheepskin and or sheep bladders and pig bladders and whatever um the other one that and this isn't really you know something that i found in the research as much as it just kind of came to me one day is that you know, for the most part, the football has pretty much always just been a plain brown ball. I mean, yes, we, you know, there was the white and the yellow and orange balls used for night. But um, with just one or two minor exceptions, like the WFL or, you know, some goofy league trying to do, you know, trying to do be innovative. Um, the football has pretty much just been plain, plain brown leather. And yet, when you think about the soccer ball, rugby balls, even basketballs, like the international basketball, it's this goofy, look, you know, like in the Olympics, it's this goofy looking thing, you know. So it's just one of those, you know, for whatever reason, you know, football has stayed true to using pure leather for the most part and um, and unadorned with all kinds of goofy stripes and decorations and you know there's decals and there's burn marks into it and all that but i don't know it's just kind of an interesting thing that for whatever reason foot, the football has remained just plain jane M much like baseball just stayed traditional yeah yeah so, yeah good good points so uh yeah, so your trajectory is you're you're taking us from the start of you know rug, rugby with you know using rugby football like you said, and you're taking us right into the modern era with with the, the book. Yeah, so it, it basically so the vast majority of the content is pre nineteen sixty because you know like I said the, you know hmm. like the NFL ball hasn't changed the. You know, so, you know, where there's more, you know, kind of modern content that, you know, has, um, you know, that typically is more with, you know, somebody who came up with some like Charlie Finley, you know, the former baseball owner, he came up with a grip enhanced ball that, you know, saw a little bit of usage and a visually enhanced ball that had different striping and saw some usage, Um you know, nineteen in the nineteen forties and fifties, especially there was the rubber footballs. You know that was a, you know, a lot of people were saying oh, this leather thing's going away. We're all going to rubber footballs, and that never really happened. But you know, rubber footballs were used in you know major you know top NCAA games into the nineteen eighties. You know, um, I mean, not all the time, but for wet games, and that's one of the things that was an option they had. Uh, so there's some stuff that's, you know, say post-1960, but, you know, it's kind of, you know, this is one of these where you tell a story that's there, right? <laughs> and and right. they're just, you know, there really hasn't been that many changes to the ball other than striping and some of those things. Um, and then obviously, you know, I cover the manufacturing process a fair amount. And so, you know, there, there have been changes, right? Um, but you know, most of those are changes that like you or I can't recognize them, you know, you know, right. it's, it's, it's really the detail quality. You know, I'm sure an NFL quarterback, um, 
can maybe tell the difference, you know, of certain kinds of balls. But, you know, I tell at least one story where, you know, a guy was given the AFL ball and the NFL ball saying, you know, you, you know, blindfolded, tell me which one is which. And he couldn't tell the difference. So, <laughs> you know, but the mind's a powerful thing. And so, you know, if you believe a ball's different, then it is different, right? Yeah, that's, that's so, definitely. Yeah. And, and again, I'm, I've am i never been an NFL quarterback that I recall. And so maybe there's differences <laughs> that I'm just, that are, I'm oblivious to, right? Right. Okay, now I got a question for you. Now, you, when you t- talk about the rubber footballs and you talk, you know, we think about, you know, like Nerf footballs when they came out and I guess they still come out. Uh, they they have the, the strings on them and it makes you think about, you know, the strings. I, I take it, I mean, it had to be engineered, like the spacing of the strings because they fit so well to the human fingers that, uh, you know, when you have your four fingers on there to throw a, a forward pass or to, just to handle the ball is that you believe that's not on purpose that they were spaced that way and has that been consistent uh so it hasn't been consistent um you know so i i think it's one you know it's like the story of the spacing of or where the stripes located you know that kind of evolved over time but like this ball has seven uh laces mm-hmm. a lot of the early balls only had six laces and and those the laces were just it's kind of like the leather, you know, the raw hide that's used to lace up a, a baseball glove. That's more or less what that stuff was like, right? Now, the white lacing is, you know, it's polyvinyl chloride. It's like the stuff in your bathroom, you know, under your bathroom sink, you know. <laughs> it's it's a very tough, you know, it's a very tough, hard plastic. Um, and, and, you know, they can still lace. It's flexible enough to be laced. But so... Um, when in, in high schools allow, uh, an eight or 12 laced ball, NCAA and NFL only use eight laced balls. And, but, you know, so it, it varied over the years, it varied a fair amount. And there were, you know, the book shows images of, you know, where they had cross lacing and, you know, people tried to do different things. You know, I mean, they were probably trying to get a little bit better touch for a quarterback and um and you know a lot of those goofy things kind of went away but had they worked then we wouldn't think they're goofy we would think they're normal right right Uh, so so yeah i mean it's been it's been kind of all over the place but um it's pretty standard and then you know nowadays the you know the the spacing is is based on tolerances and i just have to believe they're you know if you're the development guy for footballs somewhere back in time, you gave Otto Graham five different footballs with different space lacing and said, which one do you like best? Right. That's, that's kind of what they would have done. And then they settled on a particular pattern. Yeah. And they've, they've got to have tight tolerances too, because you would, you would feel it. Uh, you handle fo- footballs a lot. I mean, as an official, I handled, you know, hundred footballs every week during football season with all the games you would have and multiple balls coming in and out. And they all pretty much felt the same except different manufacturers felt different. So I, I, I will, I know you said a little bit, you know, football is a football, but I, you can tell a little bit different, at least maybe the quality of the football of, you know, the Whit Wilson's definitely the, the gold standard for, for footballs at the, the high school, college and pro level. Uh, and when you bring a different manufacturer in, it definitely feels differently. Um, I know we had uh, in Pennsylvania, you know, probably about 10 years ago, we had uh, every, everybody uses Wilson footballs all season long. And we got an announcement from the PIAA that uh, uh, Rawlings was the official football of the PIAA now. And so for the playoffs, uh, all teams, all, the only balls that could come in games were Rawlings balls. And I about, you know, freaked out of my skin. I'm calling some of my, my compatriots on my fishing crew. I'm like, I got to call these coaches because these kids have grown up with Wilson balls. Yeah. These quarterbacks will go nuts and, you know, say, Hey, you can't use that ball anymore. Here, here's this. And uh, yeah, so it definitely has a different feel. And uh, the, the coloration, uh, we, we, the first game we had was a wet game and the, the uh, team wearing white had uh, just red, 
ink all over their, their body. As soon as those balls got wet, the ink came right off them and they're a little bit darker than the Wilson balls. Yeah. Like well, that. I mean, and if, you know, high schools allow the uh, composite leather too. So, you know, that's, that's going to have a different feel. Um, you know, I mean, composite leather is like, you know, fiberboard, right? <laughs> right. Well, when I officiate, okay. you still could use a rubber ball too. I don't know if it still yeah. is. I, I believe it still is. Uh, it, it, maybe in high school, it's been banned from, uh, NCAA for right. since, since the eighties. Yeah. As of 2016, you could still use a rubber ball. I know that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, some of that's just a, you know, it's a financial issue too, you know, and that's why the composite leather is cheaper too. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's not, it's not, you know, not everybody can afford the NFL quality balls. And even those, you know, when they, when they, when they're making balls in the Wilson factory, which is in Ada, Ohio, they, um, you know, they make, you know, if they make, um, so if they got to ship 200 balls to the NFL, they end up making like a thousand balls. And then they have inspectors who are checking for every little deviation and feel and da da da. And the ones that they deem to be the best and the rule rule book even says like inspected balls or something like that. They got some term in there, but those are the ones that go for gameplay. And then the rest basically go to the growth, you know, the, you know, target and, you know, exporting goods and Amazon, all, all the yeah, rest. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so anybody can buy those, but, and then you know, like for autographs and all that kind of stuff, those are, those are separate balls from the, um, you know, from the NFL, you know, play level balls. So, so listeners, if you uh, are one of the fortunate ones that catch one of those kick balls or somebody scores a touchdown and launches one up in the stands, treasure that for more reasons than one, because you've got a, a special quality ball too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mean, as much as they try to control uh, the quality of a ball, um, you know, it still comes down to, you know, it's still human beings trying to make these things, and you know, the leather is going to be slightly different. I mean, every one of the things that kind of interesting. Every when they cut the the panels out of a piece of leather out of a hide, those four panels stay together and become a ball you know hmm. so it's not like just random panels all four panels on any given ball came from the same hide and then they they scott i think it's called skiving but basically it's slicing them to take off excess leather so that they all are the same thickness right um so and that that means that then their weight is the same and you know all those kinds of things interesting Huh. Very cool. Uh, Tim, we could uh, go on yeah. and on yeah. about this. And, uh, you know, you have so many different little aspects of the football. You have some interesting stories and takes and tangents and all connected to the football and the story of how the football evolved over time and became to what we know it as today. And probably a hundred years from now, somebody will be able to put, uh, you know, a second edition out uh, we won't be able to enjoy it but uh it'll probably evolve maybe some more in manufacturing and however it's used you know however the game goes but you know why don't you let folks know how they can get a copy of the book and uh, enjoy some of these uh little secret pieces of research that you've put together and uh collected here for us yeah so you know all my books are available on uh, amazon that's really the primary place so from Amazon, you can you know buy the paperback copy. I think that's like eighteen ninety nine or seventeen ninety nine. Um, there's a audiobook version. There's a ebook version on the Kindle, and and if you subscribe to uh, Kindle Unlimited, you get access to the book for free. So um, yeah, so really Amazon's really the primary place to find it. All right. Well, Tim, we enjoy uh, having you here talking about the book. Uh, I personally have enjoyed the book. I think the the listeners and uh, viewers are going to enjoy it when they get their copies in their hands. And uh, you know, give Tim a shout out on uh, on Twitter on his Twitter page. Uh, comment on his uh, football archaeology. Let him know how how you're enjoying the book and uh, any questions you might have. Send them his way. And Tim, if we... you read if you read it, leave a leave a review on uh, Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. Whether you like it or not, you know, it's up to you. 
Good, good point. That's uh, definitely helpful to to authors uh, when you when you do that to, to give them the feedback. So, Tim, we really appreciate you coming on here and talking about this uh, special edition here on your book, and uh, we'd love to talk to you about some more football next week. Very good. Thank you. Look forward to it. That's all the football history we have today, folks. Join us back tomorrow for more of your football history. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com.